Yeah, Penny, that was that was a really fun fight to watch. It was a bit of a slow burn, and once they got going, it was really exciting. A lot of momentum for Jack Catterall in the later rounds, and he had Regis badly hurt. First of all, what did you make of that? And then you put forward to the fans the idea of Tia Fimo coming to Manchester. Which yeah. We'd all love to it's, see it. Yeah. How realistic is that? I mean, firstly, you know, obviously, we all want always a firefight, don't we? And after three or four rounds, I'm kind of thinking, oh God, this is cagey. I mean, I, I, I don't mind watching fights like that because I find it quite fascinating, but obviously you've got however many, 8,000, 9,000 in there just want to tear up. And all of a sudden the knockdown comes, was it the fifth? Or it starts to get a bit juicier in the fifth, the knockdown comes and it changes the trajectory of the fight. And actually probably at the halfway stage, I had it very close. Might have even had Regis just edging it with a knockdown. And then all of a sudden, Jack just changed the fight. And I think that, you know, that switched up the excitement levels. Um, you could see how heavy-handed Regis was even early in the fight. And I think that got Jack's attention. And he had to be switched on. Obviously, the knockdowns came in the ninth. You know, he won 10, 11, 12. I think he won eight as well. And you've got to give a lot of respect to Regis because he was badly hurt. He tore his, he turned his ankle over. He could hardly walk in the last couple of rounds and just never stopped trying. And... You know, he said after, this is the best guy I've ever fought by a mile. And I think Jack Catchell is one of the most underrated fighters in the world. I think sometimes the style, you know, to the, the sort of casual eye, they don't necessarily realise how good he is um, because he doesn't scream and shout and he doesn't, you know, it's a bit like Liam Paro. I think Liam Paro is a sensational fighter. But just because he don't scream and shout and backflip here and do all this kind of stuff. And, you know, with regards to Teofimo Lopez, like I, you know, I said we'd, we'd love to spank him, but he is, he's a very good fighter and he's a massive star. And I doubt he would come to Manchester, but it'd be some night, wouldn't it? God, imagine bringing Teofimo Lopez to the UK. It'd be brilliant. And, you know, that was a WBO inter, international. Um, Jack is sitting at number two. I think hopefully it's going to move him closer to that number one position. And who knows what Tiafimo is going to do. I see him probably moving up to 147. He's got the legal dispute with top rank. Maybe Jack fights the winner of Barboza against Ramirez for the vacant title. But we do have two guys fighting for the IBF world title on December the 7th in Liam Parra and Richardson Hitchens. So, you know, can we bring that world championship fight here? Obviously, Liam Parra is going to say, well... What about Australia, which is something that we'll look at as well. If Hitchens wins, he's going to say, what about New York, which is something we'd look at as well. So Jack's in a great position. But when you look at his 11 months in Linares, Taylor, Pro Grey, you know, all headline fights, he really does deserve his shot. Uh, someone out of this box and see. Just want to ask you about Campbell Hatton. Obviously, two defeats in a row to Flint now. And you kind of at that English title level. Where does he go from here now? Um... I think that it's difficult because he's very young. So, like, if the guy was 29, 30, you'd say maybe that's your lot. But when you're enjoying what you do, and, and I think right now, Campbell Hatton's level is area and English title level. That's no disgrace. A lot of fighters don't even reach that level. But, obviously, with our stable and where we're looking to take fighters, we don't really work with and you know and, and kind of continuously back after back to back defeats area title and English level fighters Campbell's a little bit different one because he's a really good kid two because he works his nuts off and two because he's given us back to back brilliant fights and he's still young so Campbell's got to look at himself and say if that's my level am I happy to continue and if he's happy to continue he should absolutely continue you know, whether that's to go and get a couple of fights on, you know, smaller shows and without the pressure of the... I mean, he ends up being co-main event tonight, again, in front of, like, 8,000. It's not easy. And a lot of people thought he won the fight. I, I, you know, went in the changing room after, and I said to Ricky Hatt, Ricky thought he edged the fight. And I said, in my opinion, I thought you lost 6-4. But I'm going to give you my honest opinion. But when it's 6-4, it can go either way. But, you know, again... He gave us a brilliant fight, but he just wasn't good enough. And he's not really progressing. You know, the performance wasn't really much better, in my opinion, than the last performance. But he's young, and if he's enjoying the game, 
and wants to stay at it, then he absolutely should. Well, uh, reading the same age for international boxing. Um, were the scorecards right now? One, one for me tonight. Were the scorecards a little too wide in Jack's favour? Yeah, I think so. I haven't, I haven't. I think one was particularly. I can't really remember, but I had Regis Progre winning two rounds plus the knockdown round. So a 10-8 round, and I think the first, and then the, was the knockdown the fifth or the sixth? Fifth. So the fifth round, the first round, and one more. I think it was seven or something like that. So again, I can't, I mean, obviously it was a 10-7 round. Jack won 10-11-12, obviously. I think nine was the 10-7. Thought he won eight. I thought it was the seven, I think, Regis won. Um, Jack, I thought, won the round after the knockdown, which was the sixth. So you tell me what's the score if it's 10 8 and two rounds? I don't know, someone tell me. But yes, I thought one of the cards was, partic was particularly wide. Joni there for Hook Boxing. Eddie, do you think it would be tough, difficult to match Jack? Because like you say, he's not necessarily jumping around the press conferences, but he is so good. Like, for example, Tia Vima Do you think it would be difficult to make those fights? Yeah, I think that it will be more difficult to make because he's very good. Do you know what I mean? But if you look at tonight, if you look at the atmosphere, I mean, I, that was all of our first times. I loved it. I thought it was really good. You know, imagine when we fill it up, the atmosphere in here will be unbelievable. So that was a good crowd tonight. Like, you, you, you're not really outside of AJ and outside of, um, you know, Fury and those kind of guys. When are you seeing, like, don't forget the last fight against Taylor, he did virtually 11,000 in Leeds. You know, over 8,000 tonight. Like, it's solid numbers. So a Tiafimo Lopez fight would fill up this place. You know, so it's really all about money. I mean, if Liam Paro wins, he won the world title in Puerto Rico. He's defending it in Puerto Rico. He's probably going to say, hang on a minute, I want to go back to Australia and fight. And Jack would go. <clears throat> if Richardson wins, he's probably going to say, I want to defend in New York. And Jack would go. But maybe we come up with a number to tempt him to come here. Because he's, you know, he's, he's selling the tickets. Eddie Allen here, yeah, at RTFI. Um, I just want to mention the crowd tonight, the first event in the co-op arena. We've had many, many nights in Manchester Arena, like of Ricky and Anthony Pollard. Do you think Jack Cattrall can make this place a little bit of a fortress over the next couple of years? Because the, the fans really take to him. He's a, he's a lovely guy as well mm. as obviously having had those great results in the last year. Yeah, that's what I said, you know, after the, um, after the fight in the ring. Just a really good bloke, you know, and sometimes the Josh Taylor fight allowed him to show that little bit of spite because they hated each other. But, you know, with Regis, it's like they just respected each other. And when you bring them together, you're kind of looking for something. But in the end, you just let Jack be Jack. And that's the great thing about him is he's very real. You know, he's a, a real family man, he's a real fighter, he'll fight anyone. And yeah, I think, like, let's be honest, what other fighters from this area are going to drive those kind of numbers in there tonight and, and beyond? The only per people that are going to make bigger crowds than Jack Catchell here are the marquee fights. You know, Eubank Ben, AJ, Fury, they're the ones that are going to fill this place up. But... You know, as you remember with Crawler, you know, we started with 5,000, then we went to seven, then we went to eight, then we went to 10. And I think Jack's on the same path. Eddie, can you shed any light on what happened with Michael Gomez Jr.? Yeah, it was uh, the most bizarre and unique situation I think I've ever seen. I mean, we were sitting at ringside and Dennis Gilmartin called Frank Smith and said, can you and Eddie come backstage ASAP? And we were like, oh shit, that's really bad news because Dennis would never say that to me. So straight away you know there's a problem with a fighter. So Frank Smith went back, he sat with the doctors. When Michael Gomez arrived in the changing room, he fell ill, fell ill and he was sort of bent over in pain. The doctors looked at him, they ran some tests, I believe they took a urine sample and, and did some checks on that sample quickly and they decided that he had an infection and he wasn't fit to fight. And, you know, at that point, you're kind of like, what, are you sure? It's like, no, it's off, mate. They've, they've completely ruled him out. They said there's no way he can fight. And 
I've never known him an hour before the fight, to be honest with you. And Reese Bellotti was, you know, quite a epic zone interview where he thinks that Michael Gomez swallowed it. I'm not, you know, I don't believe a fighter would swallow it an hour before the fight, having trained for 10 weeks and not getting paid and turned up at the venue. But it's, it's a really weird one. And you know, once the British Boxing Water Control say, our doctors say he is not fit to fight, there's no way back. But obviously disappointed for Reese. Um, we'll get him another fight ASAP and, and see what happens with, uh, with Michael Gomez. October Red here. Good evening, Eddie. Good evening. Lovely evening in Manchester. Successful. A lively crowd. Mm. Are we, are you, going to start to put more shows on in the UK? You could hear the crowd. They were hungry for it. They were there. They were passionate. We want to see more fights from Matthew in the UK. Is that something that you're looking to do in 2025? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had a, a good meeting with the zone at the end of last week, and the strategy is definitely to do more. UK shows in 2025. Um, I think, you know, we've got a nice finish with Catrell Progre and Edwards against Yafai. You know, I think we're already hoping to get six or 7,000 in Birmingham, which is really good and solid. And I think the success of Riyadh season has really lifted the general interest in boxing. So I think it's a good time. Um, I, I think that sometimes there's too, too big a space between shows. And we just got to get the schedule right to make sure that there's regular activity and, and consistently big shows. We've got four or five amateur signings to announce in the next two to three weeks, as well as anywhere between two and four main event fighters as well that will feature in the early Q1 schedule. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're pumped, we're motivated. And obviously when you have nights like tonight and you see that crowd, you realise that British boxing is still alive and kicking. Eddie, James Regan from ESPN. Obviously the win was the most important thing for Jack tonight, but after that start to see him kind of get them a couple of knockdowns and mm. turn the screws, how important was that going into a potential real title fight that he showed it on the biggest stage? Yeah, I mean, you want when you're trying to grab a world championship fight, you want to look good and you want to be involved in exciting fights. So the first three or four rounds, I was kind of thinking, you know, I don't want 12 rounds of this. We're in the entertainment business, but also it's difficult when you're in with a world-class operator that can really punch. You're not just going to start jumping in. And the knockdown kind of just kicked the fight into gear. And the last six rounds were very exciting. The two knockdowns were, were really big for Jack, not just in the fight, but just in the general momentum of trying to get that shot. And I think I said in the week, Jack punches a lot harder than, than people give him credit for as well. And you know, when someone like Regis Progre says he's the best fighter I've been in with, it's a pretty big compliment, really. And um, you know, I thought he was great, Regis. James Shirayas, in, in terms of obviously the, the result has progressed Jack's career, but in terms of his knowledge bank, mm. what he'll have learned from that fight, what he's learned from the Taylor fight, I think his IQ is really, really good. Like, I think his jab is very underrated. I think his power is underrated. Um, I think he can fight on the inside. I think he's tough. I think he's got a good chin. I think he's got everything. Like, If I put him in with Teofimo Lopez, if I put him in with Devin Haney, if I put him in with Ryan Garcia, if I put you know, all of those guys, I believe that he's in 50-50 fights with, with every top name in the division. Another fighter that I think is massively underrated is Liam Parra, honestly. And, you know, Parra against Catchell is a very, very good fight. And I think it would be very unwise to, to, to rule him out in any fight against any 140 pounder. Um, because like you said, like the knowledge bank of being in with top level guys like that. And, and you know, one of the criticisms that Regis gave Jack, and I kind of get it, but at the same time, you can't just eradicate someone from your CV. You know, he says, away from Josh Taylor, who have you beaten? He's like, well, I beat him twice. So you can't just, you know, that's like saying, well, other than those six people on your resume, who have you beaten? So, but now he can add Regis Progress to that as well. And he can add Jorge Linares, but we appreciate it was at the end of his career, etc. But, you know, it's good to, to just keep putting that resume together. And... You know, if he does fight Liam Paro, he's had 12 rounds against a top five southpaw. 
in there tonight. So, you know, he's going to feel like he's got all the experience to mix it with whoever comes next. I had the Don Farrell Sporting News. Uh, CFP was obviously a dream fight. Mm. It's pretty well documented that he has some fairly big first demands at times. Um, you talk about bringing him here to Manchester. Do you think that's viable or is a CFP more Lopez Jack Carroll fight maybe something that lands on a real season card? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that we've got to be a little bit careful because obviously we want to maintain nights like that images like that you know where people see the atmosphere see the crowd and that's british boxing so we can't just look to take every headline act to Riyadh season but at the same time the aim is to make sure the opportunities are there for jack Cattrall and he's financially rewarded for it as well so i would like to keep jack in the uk if we can um but it is unlikely for tfimo to come to the uk in my opinion i mean he's still blaming me for his George Cambosis defeat when we promoted the show at Madison Square Garden. So, I, w I mean, if it went 12 rounds, I'd actually leave the arena before the scores were read out, if, if they fall. So, um, but I don't know what he's going to do. You know, he's obviously got that legal dispute with top rank. Is he going to move to 147? If he does, it could open up a, you know, um, a vacant shot as well. But obviously, with having those two fighters fighting for the IBF on December 7th, that's a clearer shot, I think. Mm. Yeah, well. yeah, I think that I'm really looking at that next era, you know, of, of fighters coming through because we talk about those headline acts coming to Riyadh season and stuff like that. When you've got Pat McCormack, when you've got William Crawler, when you've got Cameron Bong, when you've got Hamza Udeen, I mean, there's so many of them coming through. And I thought um, William Crawler was outstanding, very heavy handed. Joe McGraw as well, great talent. Um, Pat McCormack, outstanding fighter, and Janae Boston as well. You know, I think he can really fight, and he's 22. And you know, when they did the interview about Ishmael Davis, sometimes I'm a little bit too much of a cat. I'm just like, just make the fight. And then Janae's like, I'm 22, I've got a lot of time, and he's right. But I just, I love fights like that. And but I think Ishmael Davis against Sam Gilly is a fight that I would love to see if he can win a British title. The fight with Janae Boston could end up being a big fight in Yorkshire. And as I say that, the main man is here um, and Jack Cattrall. Uh <laughs>